Right after the Soviet Union put two dogs into space and successfully returned them to Earth, a disaster so big that it was kept from the public eye for decades took place at the Baikonur test range in Kazakhstan. In the late 1950s, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, and Sputnik 2, which put the first living organisms into orbit. Then, in August of 1960, two dogs, Belka and Stryka, returned alive from space. As far as the world knew, the Soviets were on a fast track towards being the first nation to put a man in orbit. However, a launch pad incident on October 24th, 1960 would prove a setback that would remain a secret for decades, leaving the grieving families to hurt in silence. The Nadalin catastrophe would become known as the single greatest disaster in the history of spaceflight, even worse than the Challenger and Columbia accidents. From the Red Army to Honorary Soviet In 1920, 18-year-old Mitrofan Ivanovich Nedelin enlisted with the Red Army, beginning a relationship that would last a lifetime. After fighting as a volunteer in the Russian Civil War, Nedelin officially joined the Communist Party in 1923 and was drafted back and promoted to top artillery commander. Throughout the late 1930s, Nedelin fought in the Spanish Civil War on the side of the Republican government and then in the 1940 Winter War. When the Soviet Union joined World War II the following year, Nedelin was appointed artillery commander of several units. During his service in the conflict, the soldier excelled at proving his leadership skills. By the end of the war, Nedelin had become the commanding officer of the artillery of the Soviet Southern Group of Forces and had earned the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal for his service. After the war, Nedelin continued to rise to the top of the Red Army for the next decade and a half. And in the early 1950s, Nedelin played a vital role in the beginning stages of the space race as he was one of the leading proponents of using intercontinental rockets instead of bombers to deliver nuclear loads. As commander-in-chief of artillery, Nedelin ordered rocket engineer Sergei Korolev to develop the R-7 intercontinental ballistic missile with a warhead large enough to carry nuclear bombs to the United States. Although this rocket was never as effective as future models, it was powerful enough to launch Sputnik, the world's first artificial Earth satellite, giving the Soviets the edge in the early space race. R-16. In 1959, Nedelin was promoted to Commander-in-Chief of the Strategic Missile Force, and his position as an essential figure in the early development of ICBMs and the space race resumed when Khrushchev elected him to oversee another top priority project, the R-16. The competing rocket was designed by Korolev's former assistant, Mikhail Yangel, and was more potent than its successor. It also had a less complex fueling system, which would render its military use impractical. Under Nedelin's leadership, the design team worked endless hours to complete the first rocket as soon as possible. Thus, the rush development left the missile with several unsolved technical problems. Because both Nedelin and chief designer Mikhail Yangel wanted to please Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev with a successful launch of the R-16 in the days leading to the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, the men agreed to deliver the first missile to the Baikonur Cosmodrome test range in September of 1960. By October 21st, the 100-foot-long, 141-ton prototype was installed on pad number 41 for final tests before the official launch. Nedelin insisted on launching before the November 7th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, and the extreme pressure to achieve it resulted in many more engineering difficulties, while pre-launch and actual launch preparations began to overlap. The Nedelin Disaster on October 24th, as repairs continued to create delays, an angry Nedelin demanded to go to the pad himself, bringing along several subordinates, designer Yangel, and other visiting dignitaries to direct the pre-launch operations personally. The repairmen were now conducting several modifications simultaneously, under the watchful eyes of some of Russia's best scientists, putting excessive stress on the workers. Thus, many safety procedures were neglected in order to save time, and one of these oversights would become their downfall. The programming current distributor device installed in the R-16 helped activate several systems on the rocket. After a rushed test, the device was set in the wrong position, setting off the batteries and propellant lines on the missile with only a single valve preventing the engines from premature ignition. Then, when a technician accidentally reset the machine, he inadvertently removed the last part that was stopping the engine from untimely combustion. At 6.45 p.m., as 250 personnel and visitors mingled around the launch pad, the second stage rocket engine of the R-16 ignited, ripping through the fuel tank and creating a massive bomb that sprayed acidic chemicals. A 
camera operator remotely activated the automatic cameras set around the pad before seeking refuge, filming the explosion in detail. The staff located furthest from the rocket were the only ones who survived, albeit with significant burn injuries. One of them was Chief Designer Yangel, who left with the test range commanding officer to smoke a cigarette in a bunker only a hundred feet away. The remaining men, including some of the most prestigious Soviet space pioneers, either instantly succumbed to their injuries or inhaled too much chemical smoke and suffocated. Massive explosions visible as far as 30 miles away continued for another 20 seconds, and the subsequent fires raged on well into the sunset. Back to work. An urgent message from designer Yangel was delivered to the Kremlin via a special communication channel on the night of the accident. It informed the Premier of the Soviet Union that during the final preparations of the R-16 launch, a fire, quote, caused the destruction of the tanks with components of the propellant. As a result of the accident, there were casualties numbered up to 100 or more people. Chief Marshal of Artillery Nidellen was present at the test site. Now the search for him is going on. Nikita Khrushchev immediately directed Leonid Brezhnev, his future successor, to fly to the Baikonur Cosmodrome with a group of experts to determine the disaster's origin. The commission blamed the incident on avoiding safety protocols, as there were too many people on the launch pad, most of whom should have remained safely off-site in bunkers. They also alleged that the men in charge of the R-16 rocket were too confident in its successful performance under extreme rushed conditions without proper analysis to justify their decisions. Yangel regretted going away for a smoke and blamed the entire incident on himself. He then suffered a heart attack that left him in bed for months. Before proceeding with the program, the Commission recommended more extensive testing and re-evaluation of pre-launch sequences to improve safety procedures going forward. After the delays caused by the Nadellan disaster, the missile's first flight happened on February 2, 1961, and the R-16 began operations in November of that same year. The rocket would continue to serve until the mid-1970s, and despite its many shortcomings, it would become the first successful intercontinental ballistic missile developed by the Soviet Union. Discovery Although the Commission set the official casualty number at 92, with 74 military men and 18 civilians, the exact number of losses remains unknown. To cover up the Nadellan disaster, the Soviet Union issued a news release that stated that war hero Chief Marshal of the Artillery Mitrofan Nedelin had perished in a plane crash. Meanwhile, the Kremlin hid the truth from the remaining grieving families, and the government told them that they all perished in the collision. As people noticed that many pioneering rocket experts disappeared from all public events around the same time, rumors of an accident started circulating in the West. Soon after the accident, a team of European journalists also picked up on rumbling about a rocket exploding near Siberia. However, their stories were buried along with many other haunting legends of missing cosmonauts, race-wiping superweapons, and other Cold War folklore. Around the same time, an American reconnaissance satellite took spotty photographs of the destroyed site and brought them back to intelligence officers. But the American government also chose to stay quiet about its findings. The disaster would remain more or less a secret for decades, and the world would only know that during the 1960s, the Soviets went from one crowning achievement to the next. As communism faced its ultimate demise, the true scope of the Nadellin disaster finally became public. In 1989, Ogunyuk magazine published the article Site 41, which revealed the truth about Nadellin's sudden passing, as well as several other nameless victims. After the publication and the fall of communism, eyewitness accounts and official documents were released in Russia, finally reconstructing the events of October 1960. Recent investigations of the Nadellin disaster have put the casualties as high as 300. However, scientists, technicians, and political figures have seemed to settle in around 122 fatalities. Today, Launch Pad 41 is an empty and abandoned lot in the Baikonur Cosmodrome in central Kazakhstan. A small monument marks the site with the written names of 54 victims who sacrificed their lives during the early days of the space race. <laughs>